Hello, good morning. It's me again, Yuri Sensei at your service. So for today video, we gotta talk about the empirical and molecular formula. So let's start. So in chemistry, a chemical formula is a consist way of representing the elements that make up a compound and the numbers of atoms of each element. There are two main types of chemical formulas. So, empirical formulas and molecular formula. So, let's start with the empirical formula. So, an empirical formula shows the simplest whole number ratio of the atoms in a compound. Is it the most reduced formula of a compound and those not necessary represent the actual number of atoms of each element in the compound. For example, an empirical formula for glucose is CH2O, which shows that there is a 1 to 1 ratio of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atom in glucose. Now, for the molecular formula, so in a molecular formula, show the actual number of atoms of each element in a compound um, is it the true formula of a compound and is it always a multiply of the empirical formula for example the molecular formula for glucose is C6H12O6 which show that there is are six carbon atoms 12 hydrogen atoms and 6 oxygen atoms in a glottose. Now, determine the empirical and molecular formula. So, the empirical formula of a compound can be determined by analyzing the elemental composition of the compound. This can be done by a variety of methods, including composition analysis, elemental analysis, or mass spectrometry so once the epi, um, <clears throat> once the empirical formula of a compound is known the molecular formula can be determined if the molecular weight of the compound is also known the molecular formula is always a multiply of the empirical formula so that the molecular formula can be found by multiplying the subscript of the empirical formula by the appropriate integers. So here are some examples of empirical and molecular formula. Empirical formula is CH2O, molecular formula C6H12O6, locus. Empirical formula CH3, tapos we have a molecular formula C2H6 ethanol. ethanol. And the formula of CH2 and molecular formula of GS2. So, in conclusion, empirical and molecular formula are two important tools for chemists. They can be used to represent the composition of compounds and determine the number of atoms of each element in a compound. I hope this video has given you a better understanding of empirical and molecular formula. So, here we have additional information. Empirical formula of a compound can be determined by dividing the mass of each element in the compound by the atomic mass of the element. The resulting numbers are then simplified to the lowest common denominator. The molecular formula of a compound can be determined by multiplying the empirical formula by the appropriate integers. The integers is found by dividing the molecular weight of a compound by the molar mass of the empirical formula. So, in empirical and molecular formula are often used in conjunction with, with each other. The empirical formula can be used to determine the molecular formula and the molecular formula can be used to determine the, the molar mass of the compound. So, here we have the image of empirical formula of CH2O. This image show that simply is whole number ratio of atoms in glutus. The carbon atoms are represented by the black circle and the hydrogen atoms are represented by the white circle. 
and the oxygen atoms is represented by the red circle and the next image here is an image of a molecular formula of c 6 h 12 6 this image shows that the actual number of atoms of each element in glucose the carbon atoms are represented by black circle while the hydrogen atoms are represented by the white circle and the oxygen atoms are represented by the red circle and here we have the glow to structure hello everyone it's me yuri sensei and today we are going to be talking about the mass ration in chemical reaction so this is very important concept in chemistry because it's allow us to predict the amount of reactant and product that will be involved in a reaction <clears throat> so the law of conservation of mass state that matter is either create or nor destroyed in chemical reaction this means that the total mass of the reactant most be equal the total mass of the products in other words if you start with 100 grams of reactant you will end up with 100 grams of product so we can use this law to write a mass balance equation for a chemical reaction a mass balance equation is an equation that show how the mass of the reactant and product are related mm. <coughs> For example, let's consider the reaction of hydrogen and oxygen to form water. <clears throat> so, the balanced chemical equation for this reaction is 2H2 plus O2 is equals to 2H2O. So, this equation tells us that 2 moles of hydrogen gas react with 1 mole of oxygen gas to form 2 moles of water vapor. We can use this equation to write a mass balance equation. Mass of hydrogen plus mass of oxygen equals mass of water. So, this equation tells us that the total mass of the reactant must be equal to the total mass of the products. So let's have another example, um, real world example. So here are some real world examples of mass ration in chemical reaction. Um, the efficiency of a fuel cell is determined by the mass ration of a reactant and product. So, a fuel cell is a device that converts the chemical energy of a fuel into electrical energy. <clears throat> so, the efficiency of the fuel cell is how much the chemical energy is converted into electrical energy. The higher the efficiency of the fuel cell, um, the more electrical energy you get from the given amount of fuel. Well, um, the amount of fertilizer that you need to apply to your law is determined by the mass ration of the fertilizer and the soil. So the fertilizer will react with the soil to form nutrients that your plants need to grow. So the amount of fertilizer that you need to apply depends on the type of the soil. So the type of the fertilizer and the desired growth are rate of your plant. So that's how the real world example. <laughs> Good morning. It's me, Jimson Ambed, aka Yuri Sensei, and today topic we are going to talk about limiting reagent so in chemistry a limiting reagent is a reactant that gets consumed first in a chemical reaction and therefore limits how much product can be formed let's say you want to make a cake you have the all the ingredients you need but uh, but you only have enough flour to make one cake so 
The fluor is the limiting reagent in this reaction because it will determine how many cakes you make. You can make. Um, another way to think about limiting reagents is to imagine that you're building a car. So, when building a car, you need a four tires plus you also need a two headlights to build the car. Not, 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 not mention the engine. So let's let's focus on the exterior of the car. So if you only have four tires, then you can only build one car. Even if you have two headlights, the tires are the limiting reagent in this reaction because they will determine how many cars you can build. So here are example of how to calculate a limiting reagent in a chemical reaction. So let's say we have the following reaction 2H2 plus O2 equals 2H2O. So this reaction tell us that two moles of hydrogen gas react with one mole of oxygen gas to form two moles of water vapor. So if we start with two moles of hydrogen gas and one mole of oxygen gas, the complete <clears throat> the the hydrogen gas is the limiting re reagent. This is because the hydrogen gas will be completely consumed before the oxygen gas and the reaction will stop. <clears throat> we can we can also use stoichiometry to calculate the limiting reagent. So stoichiometry is a study of quantitative relationship between reactant and product in chemical reaction. So to calculate a limiting reagent using stoichiometry, we need to know the moles of each reactant and the moles of ratio between the reactant. So in the example above, we know that we have two moles of hydrogen and one mole of oxygen gas. So the mole ratio between hydrogen gas and oxygen gas is 2 is to 1. So this means that every two hydro um <clears throat> this means that that for every two moles of hydrogen gas we need one mole of oxygen gas. So so if we divide the number of moles of each reactant by the mole ratio we can get the following moles of hydrogen gas divided by mole of ratio is equals to two moles to two equals to one moles and moles of oxygen gas and moles of ratio is one moles and they will be on one equals one moles Okay, I don't know how to repeat the part. So the mole of hydrogen gas is less than one mole, which means that the hydrogen gas is the limiting reagent. How to calculate the percentage of chemical reactions? Example, experimental yield less than vertical yield. So here we have 1.20 grams of copper sulfate that react with an excess of zinc metal to form 0.421 grams of copper metal. So the theoretical yield for this chemical reaction is 0.478 grams of copper metal. So the question is, what is the percent yield for this chemical reaction? So Step number one, identify the theoretical yield for the given chemical reaction. So since both the chem experimental and theoretical yields were given in the problem, since we know that 0 0.421 grams of copper metal was formed in the reaction, the experimental yield is 0 0.421 grams. Now step number two, identify the actual or experimental yield for the given chemical reaction. We are told in the problem that the theoretical yield is 0 0.478 grams, which is we can see from looking at the yields that our experimental yield was less than we would theoretically expect. So 
our percent yield should be less than 100%. <clears throat> now, step number three. Plug the yields from step one and step two into the percent yield formula and calculate the percent yield for the chemical reaction. Now, <clears throat> now that we have identified the experimental and theoretical yields, we just need to plug them into our formula for percent yield, which is percent yields equals actual or experimental yields, then theoretical yields times 100%. So 0 0.421 grams and 0 0.478 grams times 100% is equal to 88. 0.075% so if we round the one decimal place the percent yield for this chemical reaction is actually 88.1% now how to calculate the percent yield of chemical reaction example if experimental yield was greater than theoretical yield so let's say we have ano, magnesium carbonate was decomposed to magnesium oxide and carbon dioxide in chemical reaction. <clears throat> so, the theoretical yield of magnesium oxide in this experiment was 19 grams. And the experimental yield for the magnesium oxide was 21 grams. Now, the question is, what is the percent yield of magnesium oxide in this composition reaction so step number one identify the theoretical need of the given chemical reaction reading through the problem um, we know that the experimental need is 21 grams now step number two identify the actual or the experimental need for the given chemical reaction so the problem state that the theoretical need is 19 grams We can see that more magnesium oxide was collected in the reaction than was expected by the theoretical field. So, we expect to find the percent heat that is greater than 100%. This can be happened sometimes in chemical reaction, where more product was collected than the was expected theoretically. So, this is likely indicate that it indicates an error. error in a experiment or additional chemical reaction taking place that we are not accounted for but it is a potential outcome for experimental nothingness so step three plug the heat from step one and step two into the percent heat formula and then calculate the percent heat for the chemical reaction so we have percent heat equals aqual or experimental yield then theoretical yield times 100% so equals that will be 21 grams and 19 grams times 100% is equals to 110.526% so if we round the one decimal place the percent yield for this chemical reaction should be 110.5% so that's all for today's topic thank you for listening and goodbye your sensei will be signing off